Hello, Mind Bloomers. This is Mind Bloom, the safe space at the intersection of mental health advocacy and breast cancer awareness. Mind Bloom is your podcast. Come back weekly and listen to my guests as they reflect on their close encounters with emotional disorders and breast cancer. Not an easy task, but we promise to make your mind bloom. Hello, Mind Bloomers. This is Marina G, your host, and this is Mind Bloom. Please remember, the content provided by Mind Bloom is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking medical treatment because of any content referenced or authored by Mind Bloom You. Hi guys! Hello and welcome to another episode of Mind Bloom, episode 31. When I look outside my window, there's no more foliage in the trees and the parks look pretty barren as well. It's winter, it's here, and it's here to stay in New York for another three or four long months. Hopefully, the COVID-19 vaccine will start showing effects soon. Today, uh, December 14th, the first vaccine was administered in New York. And I'm keeping all my fingers crossed that this strategy will work and that the rates of infection and of mortality uh, will start decreasing very, very soon. I know we won't be able to get rid of our masks anytime soon or social distancing, but at this point, um, I'll take anything. And the vaccine seems like a pretty good bet. I was watching a documentary the other day on the CRISPR technology in biogenetics. CRISPR is an acronym and it's spelled C-R-I-S-P-R. And from what I was able to understand from the documentary, which was not a lot, is that CRISPR can emulate the spikes of the protein of uh, the COVID-19 virus. And once injected in our bodies, our DNA will be able to copy and paste, so to say, in a very simplistic way, copy and paste that DNA from the virus and therefore we can cheat our bodies, uh, our T-cells, I think, into believing that we have the antibodies for COVID-19. So it's all genetics, it's all science and state-of-the-art technology. It's not the inoculation of the virus itself into our bodies. So we're not going to, as with the flu, we're not going to have a few symptoms of COVID for the first couple of days, and then uh, we should be okay. It's nothing like that at all. It's really uh, meddling and uh, interfering (laughs) with our DNAs. And I think that's awesome. (laughs) Of course, it's the unknown, and there's a lot of questions, and... Not so much from the scientific community because this CRISPR technology has been used for maybe 10 years now and they've been trying to find all sorts of cures for diseases such as Alzheimer's, um, sickle cell disease and tons of other um, degenerative and genetic uh, diseases such as ALS, the condition that eventually killed Stephen Hawking and so many others, or MS, and maybe hopefully a few types of cancer, since cancer has among its causes um, the genetic propensity to develop it. 
So I find all of this fascinating and I trust the medical and scientific community and I believe we'll all pull through as a society and in our own families and communities. What about you? Where do you stand in terms of the COVID-19 vaccine? Are you looking forward to it? Are you expecting to be one of the first to be getting it? And how do you think this will impact society and our lives? Reach out anytime about this topic or any other. I'm all ears and I'm here for you, especially if you would like to talk about mental health or breast cancer. I am not a psychologist and I am not a doctor, but I have a big heart and I'm a good listener. You know, you can find me on most social media platforms at MindBloomU, on Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and Facebook at MindBloomU. You can look for the website MindBloomU.com. You can send me an email to info at MindBloomU.com. And you can visit the YouTube channel. Just write down MindBloom. And my guests and interviews would pop up, hopefully. Don't forget to subscribe, to listen, to review on the Apple Podcasts app. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash mindbloomyou. And I have very recently started a TikTok account. It's also at mindbloomyou. But don't get too excited. It's only posts so far (laughs) of my dog running in the snow. Bianca loves the snow and I can't wait for us to have some here in New York City so that she can play and run and spend all her energies (laughs) outside and be a very good dog inside. Very tired dog inside the house. So hello, TikTok and TikTokers. I am to be found there at Mind Bloom You. Now, something very weird happened with my Instagram account at Mind Bloom You last week. I have a personal account and I have the Mind Bloom You account, and each have their own emails, different emails associated um, with each account. And for the longest time, in fact, until last week, I didn't want to have both accounts on my phone and have the ability to switch in between accounts on my phone because I was guessing, and I guessed right, that this would just confuse my iPhone 7 a lot and I could just imagine that I'd be logged out a lot and... uh, It would be just a big mess to, you know, I'd have to be logging back in again every single time I switched accounts. Anyway, so for, what, six months, I haven't added the personal account to to the app, to uh, the Instagram app. And I did last week, and because I thought uh, that my personal account, which, by the way, is uh, feisty candy... (laughs) So I thought that my personal account would be a good platform to feature some of my uh, bakes, the latest loaves of bread, the latest cakes and cookies, uh, my Christmas menu, you know, all of that, and also pictures of Bianca. So last week I was fumbling with both of these, and sometimes I'll uh, use my personal account to like and or comment on the Mind Bloom You account because, I mean, why not? You have to love yourself, isn't that what they say? <laughs> so I was fumbling with my phone uh, and all of a sudden I receive um, a notification from Instagram saying someone tried to log in to my account to Mind Bloom You and please enter this code uh, when prompted. Uh, so I got a text message with my uh, with a code. I entered the code uh, wherever it was that I was prompted to do so. 
and lo and behold, the account disappeared, vanished. And if I looked it up, it was gone. And so was the hashtag MindBloomYou, everything. So obviously now I'm in a panic and I don't know what to do. And um, at some point I realize that there's really nothing I can do other than wait because they're asking me to wait for 24 hours until they deliberate and make a decision. Uh, so I wait the 24 hours. And when that deliberation comes, they say my account was disabled. And they don't say why. Um, I just get the message that I may have violated um, the community guidelines. And if I disagree with this decision, if I think that this decision was made by mistake, then I can appeal by filling out a form that they send you. So I did. I appealed three times already. I've contacted Facebook for business because luckily I have the, ma uh, the Mind Bloom business page linked to my Instagram. And so I'm a client that they pay attention to because I have spent money on advertisement. So they're always very agreeable and helpful and they go the extra mile on these Facebook customer support chats. They are very nice. I don't have anything bad to say about um, these representatives. But the truth is that there's not a lot they can do because they're on the Facebook side and not on the Instagram side, although Facebook owns both. And last week I was told to wait for a decision from Instagram. And this week the lady I spoke with has told me to wait for a decision from Instagram. She says it's not helpful to submit uh, multiple appeals because that only delays the process, their decision-making process, and that I should rather wait until I hear from them. So now the wait is what's ahead of me and mind bloom you and we'll see so i've cried them tears i've been very sad i've been very confused and frustrated and now i'm just um accepting of what's happened and i'm trying to take something away from this namely heck i'll be saving all my captions from now on, on an Excel sheet. That's an extra layer of work, but I will not take Instagram for granted anymore. I thought it was just there. It would never go away unless I wanted it to go away. And so many of the posts I wrote on Instagram, I would like to turn into blog posts and now I don't have that option. So if you're like me and you, you, you write a lot on Instagram and you use the account for microblogging because it's really, that's really what it is, then save your texts, your writings, your captions elsewhere so that you don't lose them. So I hope I'll have more news next week. Who knows? In the meantime, I haven't yet, but in the meantime, maybe I'll start a new Mind Bloom You account with a slightly different username, but I'm not there yet. I'm still a little bit in denial, although more accepting of what's happened. The good news is I was able to reach out to those that matter the most to me on Instagram um, and our little community is back together. So I miss those people so much and but now I have them in my circle again and I feel happy um, that that is the case and that they were so welcoming and so supportive as always. Um, so yeah, I will keep you posted. Please don't think badly of me. I know maybe I did something wrong. Hey, you know, maybe I keep thinking I, you know, I know I 
screenshot the book cover of uh, my last interviewee from Google. So maybe I infringed copyright terms or, you know, I know I have posted and supported and posted on my stories as well some shots of um, women showing the, their chests naked after a, mas a mastectomy. I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. If you followed my account, you can see that I had 24, 30 likes. So it's not like I'm um, purchasing likes or purchasing followers or purchasing... What else can you purchase? So, so yeah, it's a, a bit devastating. But, you know, this too shall pass. So don't go anywhere. We have an awesome interview. And I am so excited to tell you more about my guest. My guest this week is Karen Rich. She is a fertility coach. And um, at some point she also struggled with breast cancer. Fertility or infertility and breast cancer is a topic we don't really talk about much here at Mind Bloom, and so I'm very excited that this week we have the chance to do so. Karen is an infertility expert and she arrived at this business from experiencing infertility and miscarriage herself. She calls herself, uh, nevertheless, a survivor, a thriver. And after eight years of an intense battle against her own body, not only in the case of infertility, but also in that she was diagnosed with non-invasive breast cancer at some point in this journey. After these grueling eight years, Karen realized that this was maybe her calling and this was maybe the reason why she had gone through so much. It was to help others shorten their own journeys through infertility. So now she has a thriving business called Karen Rich Fertility Coach and I will leave links to her um, social media pages and her website in the show notes. So stay tuned for my interview with Karen. It's right after this. Guys, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Uh, turns out it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. It will also distribute your podcast for you so that everyone can listen to it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and many, many more. And guess what? You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go Download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. Hello, Karen. How are you? Welcome. Oh, thank you, Marina. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Uh, we are going to be talking for the first time on Mind Bloom on breast cancer and fertility. So that is major for me. And I thank you so, so much for taking the time to explain to us uh, all the things you know um, about the, well, the two topics. <laughs> um, and uh, first off, what makes your mind bloom, Karen? Um, having a growth mindset, honestly, I think that having been raised with a very fixed mindset, mm -hmm. I, I had this preconceived notion that I knew what I knew and I could become what I could become. And when that concept of growth versus fixed mindset was presented to me, mm -hmm. my mind literally did bloom. It was like blown. It was like, Phew. 
oh my gosh, like I could be anything I want to be. <laughs> you know, if I want to run, I can run. You know, you know, I don't have to listen to people tell me that I, my toenails are going to fall off and, you know, I'm not built for that. I'm too small. I'm, you know, I think that, um, I think that's something that everybody can actually, no matter what part of their life they're in or no matter what situation they're in, if they can understand that you can grow regardless of what is happening, that there's the world is your oyster. Mm -hmm. And that happened to me because I did not necessarily have a growth mindset when I was going through my own fertility journey. I would say when I had breast cancer, I, my mindset was a little bit different because of the experiences Mm -hmm. that I had gone through. So Mm -hmm. growth mindset absolutely just makes my mind bloom and honestly makes me happy. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, and we were talking a little bit about this just before recording, how sometimes, unfortunately, we come to this growth mindset, and I feel the same way, but through a traumatic experience. It's like, can't we just learn it the good way, (laughs) the healthy way? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, but you know what, such is life. And I never understood the comment that youth is wasted on the young Mm -hmm. um, more so than I do now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm about to embark on a pretty big birthday next year, not yet. (laughs) And, you know, I would not go back into my twenties for anything. I, Mm -hmm. I really wouldn't. And in some ways I'm a little jealous of people who, you know, not in in a destructive way. I'm jealous of people who were able to find that growth mindset earlier than I was. I guess I should be saying I'm grateful that I found it at all because I know lots of people who will never find a growth mindset and will die on their deathbed having regrets. So Mm -hmm. um, 100%, yeah. Mm -hmm. And resentment, regrets and resentment. No, Mm -hmm. you don't want those in your life. Mm -hmm. No. All right. So tell us uh, a little bit more about you, Karen, and about... Um, you called it the journey you embarked on uh, helping others um, become fertile uh, mm-hmm. and give birth. So tell us more, including, if you don't mind, the, the breast cancer part sure. of, your, mm-hmm. of your... Absolutely, yeah. So my name is Karen Rich. For, for those of you who are new to me, and I am a fertility coach, and I help women and couples through the infertility journey um, more quickly and easily than they can get there on their own. And that um, idea was sparked after a lot of unpacking of emotions for the basically eight year journey of my infertility to have the family that I have now. Um, I was able to give birth to four children and um, my my story is very bittersweet along the way. Five miscarriages. I, I lost a tube with an ectopic pregnancy. Fifteen um, art cycles, which is assisted reproductive technology cycles, and basically a, a five year period um, that it took me to have my second pregnancy. And unfortunately, that pregnancy. Um, ended very bittersweet in that um, one of my twins, my second pregnancy was a a twin pregnancy and one of my twins um, passed away, my second son and my um, surviving twin, my my middle daughter, Olive spent 135 days in in the NICU. And I spent a lot of time, I was always the kind of person who would try to find the happy side of things. I really was, I was a half glass, um, full, not mm-hmm. empty person. Mm-hmm. And my husband is very much the opposite. And obviously going through years and years of infertility treatments and what it does to you emotionally and physically and financially, frankly, mm-hmm. is very difficult. And I felt like our answers were, were her, you know, given to us once we finally had this successful pregnancy that was going so, so well. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I wrote an article, um, for a, um, 
an online magazine called Modern Mom last week, right after uh, Chrissy Teigen and John Legend lost their child because what happened to them was very similar. Both of my babies were thriving in my belly, but it was my body. And that is a heartbreaking um, thing to have to wrestle with. And um, so, you know, here I was, uh, you know, able to say, okay, we went through the five years of infertility and, and all of the treatments and all of the miscarriages because we were meant to have these twins. So then there I was in the hospital because thankfully um, my cervix closed back up after Olive was born, my second son. And then from that time until Olive was born was another five weeks which is miraculous. I'm written up in, in medical journals. It's very, it's not very common that once the cervix opens up, typically you will deliver both children. But for me, it did not happen that way, thankfully. You delivered the stillborn? He was not stillborn. Oh, I'm sorry. He was, he was healthy. He was healthy, just born a little bit too early for medical intervention. Um, so again, you know, even right before I went in to deliver him, um, he was fine. It wasn't, mm. it wasn't him. It was my mm. body, which is something I need to, you know, I needed to um, really um, unpack. <laughs> um, and in some ways I'm, I'm still unpacking, but so, you know, I, I really was like, okay, this is why, you know, we were meant to have these twins and then boom, I'm in the hospital. And I remember sitting in my hospital room saying, okay, God, what the heck? Like, I really thought we went through everything that we went through so we could have these twins. And now this, and every single day it was doom and gloom from the doctors. And, and um, they literally were, were monitoring my pregnancy in the NICU up until the second. She was born, um, you know, my water broke with her or started leaking rather at about um, 22 something weeks. And usually 23 is the minimum that they will take them. So 23 and four days is when she was born. And she, she had less than a 5% chance of survival. She was less than a can of Coke. She was nine tenths of a pound, 435 grams, you know, for all intents and purposes, really, there was not a lot of hope. And, um, you know, I learned a lot about myself through that experience, but, um, after everything, and, and she is a special needs child. She has a lot of um, intervention. She's had 40 plus surgeries. You know, here I was, you know, um, getting her the care that she needed. And, you know, she was, you know, just, she had just turned two years old. And we had frozen embryos. And um, I had gone back to my fertility doctor because my regular doctor would not treat me for a thyroid condition. My thyroid kept mounting and mounting and mounting. And at four and a half for my TSH, I was like, this is not right. But, you know, for those of us who have thyroid conditions, we know that we don't feel well. And I don't care what lab core says, four and a half is not okay. So I'd gone to her and she had put me on Synthroid. And at the same time, I was thinking of just kind of putting those embryos in because I didn't have the heart to just discard them. And obviously after everything we had been through financially, emotionally, physically, um, and my, um, <laughs> and my OB at the time, my MFM, um, telling me that it was my body's fault and that I should never, ever, ever get pregnant again, that I couldn't carry it. I couldn't handle it. Um, I was having some symptoms and she wanted to do an HSG, which is something, um, where we look to just make sure that there is no, um, fibroids or, or, or anything like that. And I said, okay, let's do it. And she said, Karen, you know, I don't do that until after you get your period. And I literally looked at her and I was like, really? Like, come on. Like after everything, she's like, nope, I won't do it. And wouldn't you know <laughs> that two weeks after I started my Synthroid, we achieved a natural pregnancy when I was 42 with one fallopian tube. Wow. And that is my third child. And um, then after that happened, after I had her. And that wasn't an easy thing either. She wound up in the NICU for a complication as well. But it wasn't until about a year after I had had her that I was able to look back and say, this is why. Because we probably 
I, I don't know, you know, had we had twins and then had a fourth child, I, I think it would have thrown my husband over the edge. Um, it was meant to happen this way. And ultimately I was able through my growth mindset that I worked on so diligently and a lot of therapy and, and a lot of talking it through and working it out and journaling to realize that Olive, Olive's twin was meant to be on this earth for the reason that he was to save his sister. Mm-hmm. And um, a, a little while after that, it then became obvious to me It just something was sitting on my heart for a very long time that I needed to help other women through this journey. And um, a little bit before that happened, unfortunately, I was um, my mother has had breast cancer um, at a little bit of an older age, but I was always monitored. In fact, before I started any of my fertility treatments, my doctor insisted that I get a baseline mammogram and I had gone as long as I wasn't pregnant, which was pretty often um, within that 10 year period, I had gone for mammograms as very often just to keep an eye on the breast tissue. And um, shortly after my third daughter was born, um, I went for a routine mammogram and didn't really think much of it when they called me back to the bigger facility to have an ultrasound and another mammogram because that was an oftentimes occurrence for me. But where I did get nervous was that, you know, after the ultrasound and the second mammogram that I didn't get handed my little slip of paper, I got called back into the radiologist's office. So I knew. I knew. And, you know, it was a dark office and I got called in and you could see up on the screen was this thing circled. You didn't get a biopsy. So, so so it was suspicious. And Mm. basically she said that to me and I said, you know, doctor, give it to me straight. And she said, and I, she's like, listen, I won't know anything till after a biopsy, but I'm pretty sure it's cancer. Mm. So I did, I pushed, it was like the end of the year. It was right before new year's. And I pushed to have the biopsy done right then and there. They pushed through all the paperwork just, you know, for, for, you know, um, you know, having to meet another um, deductible the next year would not have been good. So we did. And and two days after um, New Year's, I got the phone call confirming that it was cancer and, um, you know, started the whole, um, you know, found a breast surgeon who I really, really loved. And, you know, fortunately for me, it was estrogen positive. And fortunately for me, it was very, very early um, and treatable. Um, what you know, was it? Um, what cancer uh, was it? Uh, DCIS, mm. I believe. Mm. Um, and, um, again, estrogen positive being a good thing. Um, and, um, but, but stage one, very early stage one, mm-hmm. um, you know, as the breast surgeon put it, you know, if there's a cancer to get, this is it. Yeah. So, um, which is kind of a funny thing to say, but you know, <laughs> It's the truth. And yeah. because of my diligence with going for my yearly mammograms and, and being on top of it, I, um, you know, it, it was found, um, you know, it, it, um, it felt like another one of those situations though, like God really, like after everything, <laughs> really, like it kind of felt like a sick joke, but, um, I'm very grateful that it was found early. I'm three and a half years out survivor status. Um, I am, you know, in the stage where I'm still on tamoxifen and um, I um, unfortunately, you know, need to go for DNCs every couple, (laughs) every six months and and follow up and and, um, mammograms and MRIs and and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I was very lucky. But, you know, the one thing that I couldn't, help but think about and the irony of October being breast cancer awareness month as well as infant loss and and pregnancy loss month is that you know I do believe there is some kind of connection there Mm -hmm. now mind you at the time I never researched you know hey is there a connection between the infertility drugs that I took for so many years and breast cancer because honestly it wouldn't have changed what I would have done. I wouldn't have done anything differently because it was the only way that I could get pregnant was by taking the drug. So it did, it was, it behooved me not to Google if there was a connection, but 
you know, that was the first thing I asked the breast surgeon when I sat there. I said, do you think that, you know, all the fertility drugs I took had an impact? And basically, you know, she gave me the stock answer of research shows that there is no increase in breast cancer or cervical cancers from it. But, you know, a a quick Google search will show otherwise that there is, especially in women under 50 who have a successful pregnancy they are at higher risk for breast cancer than a woman who went through fertility and didn't have a successful pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I can't help thinking about it. I mean, it was also in the same spot in the same breast where I had mastitis after I stopped breastfeeding um, in the exact spot. Like I remember. Um, So, you know, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, I certainly think that the fact that my cancer was estrogen positive and there are, there were so many of the drugs that I took that raised my estrogen to astronomical levels that is not normal for your body. I mean, I, you know, there were times where I had, you know, over 20 eggs, you know, the estrogen those eggs are giving off is not natural. Plus you're being given all these other forms of it. Um, Plus I had a twin pregnancy where my estrogen was like five times what it would be with a singleton pregnancy. So, um, You know, it was after all of this growth and after all of this, I had to, in order to wrap my mind around everything that had transpired, I needed to um, find myself in there after I went on this personal development journey. And that's when this longing in my heart that I'd always been there finally bubbled up. And I was at a personal development conference two years ago. And it was in that moment that I made a decision that I need to help other women through this journey. That is my calling. That is what I meant that we went through all of this for a reason. Life happened for me, not to me. And the second that I took that control back and stopped looking at myself as a victim is when everything changed for me. I see it exactly. Yeah. We do this Joe, this Job prayer constantly, right? Why me? Um, and you, you get a lot of anger and you, you, you get mad at God and whoever else wants to be in your way. Why me? Why again? Why this? Why that? I thought we had it figured out, God. Why did you do this now? And But there's one, there's a day when you do get all your answers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when that day comes, you do regain control as, as much as it is possible uh, to regain control in this crazy uh, life and world. But you do regain it a little bit. And that's when uh, you turn the tables and you offer your experience and your own personal journey to others and you Mm -hmm. surrender and you say this this is me uh if you want i can help you and i can talk with you and i can be a shoulder for you if you need so i totally exactly and and the funny thing is too is that the second that i realized that i never had control in the first place yeah you know, because I think we all have this false sense of control. Like I certainly, um, you know, I was writing about this last night that, you know, silly me, how naive I was that I thought that I had finally gotten pregnant and I got pregnant with Mm. twins and I had hit my second trimester that nothing would go wrong. Like we have no control. You can only control what's within your control Mm. and you have to be okay with that in life because we all have no control. I mean, the last year, This last year has been, you know, even more so, you know, proved to us that we have no control. We have no control over what happens to us. We can only control what's within our, you know, wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, The more you talk, the more it resonates with me. Uh, Not, it's not obviously the same experience. No one, no, no two people have the same experience, but... But yeah, that is that is true. Um, even you, you talking about your your pregnancy, uh, one of my good good friends of life went through something very 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 similar, as well. So you know, it's don't blame yourself. And I know you're still working on that, but it happens. It happens. It's not. Uh, y- 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 there's nothing intrinsically wrong 
about you. I'm going to give you another example. Yes, estrogen positive. Yes, you've taken fertility drugs for many years. Look, I interview on a daily basis women who are 27 years old mm -hmm. when they're diagnosed with breast cancer. Where's the fertility drugs there? Mm -hmm. Where's the pregnancies? Where are no, don't don't. We know we we want to regain control and that's why we ask the questions. Did I do this wrong? Was it the birth control pill? I, I asked myself, you know, you ask all the questions. Was it what I eat? Was it was it the ice cream I had last night? Mm -hmm. y you know, you want to find an answer. You want to find a reason to regain some control. But it is very random. It is very mm -hmm. random. <laughs> unfortunately you are you are so right and i think one of the things that you know that we can see um you know again using chrissy teigen as an example is it doesn't matter how much money you have mm -hmm. it doesn't you know look at kelly preston who passed oh. away of breast cancer last year it doesn't matter how this much year. money you have or how much fame at the end of the day these horrible things happen to all of us yeah. it's like we're not singled out like yeah. You know, I, and I think that that's something important to remember that, again, you know, you can control the amount of sugar. We know sugar, you know, causes cancer in our bodies. And certainly I try to control the sugar and the carbs, you know. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, again, a 27-year-old woman, there's got to be a genetic component to that. And there's nothing that you can do about your genes. Yeah. You can do something by cutting, you know, down your inflammation and your sugar and your carbs. Sure. But at the end of the day, you know, I think the most important thing that I figured out also, and I hope we all can figure out is that we don't get to know why. Yeah. It doesn't matter why. And the longer you search for why, it, it's just going it, to, it, it's yeah. just going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. Like you have to just sit down and say, okay, what did I learn from this situation? Um, I was privileged to um, be on the book launch team for Rachel Hollis's new book, Didn't See That Coming. And one of the most important messages that we talked about in our um, discussion was there is a way to still find joy when there's grief. Yeah. And you have to find joy when there's grief because otherwise you're going down a rabbit hole that you don't want to go down. Let's talk a little bit about that then. Tell me more about, about your coaching career. So that pivotal moment at that personal development conference quickly turned into how can, what can I do? How can I, you know, how can I start this up? And essentially, you know, I, I started putting the pieces together and, you know, there are fertility coaches out there. There are other fertility coaches out there, but I think each of us, um, bring very unique, um, um, ideas to the coaching and mine is essentially based around um you know several things and and patterns that i see over and over and over again and <clears throat> one of the biggest ones that i see is i see these smart women not advocating for themselves these mm. smart smart women and i was prey to that too like i in my gut knew something was wrong with those twins and i just again, had this false sense of hope because if the doctor told me it was okay, it should have been okay. Well, no, it wasn't. Um, so um, I started, um, you know, working um, working on content that was geared and, and my website is all geared at helping women, you know, through this journey and um, through one-on-one -on -one coaching and a digital course that I have coming soon and, you know, challenges that I have and, and free courses that I have is how I help women. And I also have a, a Facebook group um, where I help women just feel normalized through it. Yeah. You know, one thing I often share is that to this day, it is impossible for me to look at a pregnant woman without some kind of jealousy. And that may sound, you know, ass backwards to some of your listeners, because I, I did go on to have pregnancies, but fertility is something that, um, you know, did not come easy for me. And in my mind, no matter what, when I look at that pregnant woman, which really may not be the case, she got pregnant like that. Mm -hmm. Right. And 
sharing my experiences and my thoughts and, and putting my heart out there has helped so many women that I've worked with feel like there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you that you can't go to your best friend's, you know, bridal sh- uh, baby shower. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, there's this, there's this people pleasing attitude that we all have that we really have to kind of bring in when we're going through something stressful, like infertility. Um, Stress has been shown to increase cortisol and inflammation and so many bad things that you don't want when you're trying to get pregnant. You need to have an environment that's wholly, um, um, you know, accepting of that embryo, right? Um, So, you know, basically it has just been something that rewards me so much um, in that it lights me on fire to help other women through this journey. The first woman who I ever worked with, you know, when she texted me that she was pregnant, you know, and she had a rough road, it, it brought tears to my eyes. And, you know, I was there, um, you know, when they did a bris for her son, um, you know, um, which is a Jewish ritual um, of, of taking on God. And it just, I, the whole time I was sitting there in chills Um, you know, and, and the note, you know, thank you so much for for helping us get to this day. Um, you know, just the feedback that I get, um, is just so important. You know, there were several young women that I worked with recently who, you know, it was glaringly obvious to me that they had a thyroid problem. They had Mm -hmm. both had miscarriages. And, um, you know, when I get those messages, hey, I just wanted you to know I'm pregnant. Hey, just wanted you to know not only am I pregnant, I could hear the heartbeat. Um, I've made it into my second trimester. Like, those are the things that light me on fire. And if I was even a small part of that, Mm -hmm. it's so rewarding to me. Um, One of the things when you boil down my belief system is that I believe that anybody who wants to be a mother can be a mother, as long as you are open to the path of getting there. It doesn't always happen the way you want it to. Just like with a birth plan, right? You can go into a birth plan and say, no drugs. I want this. Mm -hmm. You have to be open to the situation Mm -hmm. and you can't, you know, spending time on disappointment is not worth it. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be open. But There are so much with modern science and medicine um, these days that we can do. Anybody can be a mother. But again, it may not happen. I've worked with women who have had to do, um, you know, surrogacy with their own eggs and sperm. I've worked with women who've had to do donor eggs with their husband's sperm. I've Mm -hmm. I've worked with um, couples who have had to have donor sperm and donor Mm eggs. You know, you know, I do believe that. Well, yes, it's such a beautiful thing to be able to have that child grow and live inside of you. There's so much more to being a parent than growing that baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that means, you know, somebody else, you know, had a baby through adoption. Mm-hmm. You know, there, that does not take away anything mm-hmm. from that whole process of, of um, finding your family. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I think that there are so many ways in, in, in today's society for us to be parents. And, you know, again, I am there to be that voice of hope. And that voice to tell you that it will happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we might have to pivot several times Mm -hmm. and there might be testing and there might be lots of of things that we can do. Just be open and you will be a mother. Mm -hmm. So who comes to you? I mean, I understand, obviously, couples and uh, women um, with fertility issues, but at what point, let's say, in their in their fertility journey, do they come to you? I bet they're exhausted. They're they're they've tried everything. They're disappointed versus open to um, the route a- ahead of them. So tell us more about your clients, and then what what do you do? I mean, I can imagine you staying with them for years sometimes until the point they get pre- finally get pregnant if they do. Um, so yeah, t- tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, There are women from all different stages because um, there are women who choose to go through fertility treatments and there are women who choose, you know, to go a little bit slower and to still continue to try on their own. Mm -hmm. So um, typically my clients have been trying to have a baby for six months or more. 
And um, sometimes they've been through fertility treatments, IUIs, other IVFs. Sometimes they haven't. So it's really, you know, across the spectrum. Um, there are clients who come to me after several miscarriages. Um, there are clients who come to me um, before they're even starting to get pregnant. Okay. Um, it really depends on um, the enlightenment phase that they're in. Um, I think being classified as infertile is something that just is, is bone crushing. It really is. And you need to find your people, so to say. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I started this free support group is my problem with a lot of the support groups that are out there is that they're so enormous. They're very impersonal. And more often than not, they're run by people who've never had success. So what kind of advice are you getting? Yeah. Um, it's a free for all. It's become a free for all. And, um, you know, that is not something that is um, going to help your stress level. When um, you see, um, you know, please add me to the pregnancy group or please add this or, you know, I have a very small, intimate what stays here or stays here. Um, be yourself, you know, no judgment kind mm -hmm. of zone. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's very important to me in, in terms of, you know, my coaching. I've got, you know, various different packages. You know, I would love to be able, um, you know, to do this as the Red Cross and, and provide it service free. But um, as we know, running a business <laughs> costs money and time and, and all of that fun stuff. So I have various different packages. Um you know, opening price point being more of a digital course, obviously, where they can work through it on their own. Um, and then I have a um, kind of middle ground package where we work together for 30 days through Zoom calls and, and personalized um, information. And then there is more of a 90 day program, which, you know, can take you through um, a little bit longer of a cycle that would um, entail um, lots of testing and then, mm. you know, pre-work for a cycle and then post-work taking mm. you through the two week wait and, you know, your first ultrasound. So, um, you know, there, there are various different ways, um, that I work with women, you know, it really just depends on, um, you know, what works for them. Mm -mm. So a lot has to do with the emotional wellness and, and mental wellness of, of, of these women, because a lot of it, it is waiting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and it's very hard, you know, being stuck, yeah. um, being stuck in the infertility journey sucks. I mean, I'm just going to say it and call it what it is. It sucks. Yeah. Um, but there are things that we can do together. Um, you know, I help, women find ways to pay for infertility treatments. I help women, um, you know, do a couple of things before they even go for infertility treatments that perhaps haven't mm -hmm. been tested. This past weekend, I was talking with a young woman who has been trying to have her second child for um, a couple of years now. And, you know, we just went through a couple of things and I was like, yeah, have you had this? Have you had this? Have you had this? And she was like, no, no, no. And I'm like, see, Mm -hmm. Doctors just want to push you right into, or fertility doctors, mm -hmm. if you're going to see one, want to push you right into a cycle right away. They don't mm -hmm. want to waste their time with basal body testing and um, progesterone testing and all these other things, which could be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of women don't even understand what a normal cycle is. They don't understand that just because you get a period doesn't mean that you're ovulating. Mm -hmm. And we all know that if you want to get pregnant naturally, you need to ovulate an egg mm -hmm. or else there's nothing to fertilize, mm -hmm. right? So there's so many different things that I go through with my clients, like almost like a checklist. And I've got, you know, personalized sheets and workbooks and things to, to help them through, um, you know, that I've learned through, you know, my own experiences, as well as the women that I coach, um, you know, infertility has become so cold, clinical, and even more impersonal since I went through it, because one in eight women today will go through um, infertility treatments. Mm. And, um, you know, it wasn't quite that bad when I was going through it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there needs to be legislation that needs to be changed where everybody should have infertility coverage. It's not fair that women mm -hmm. get penalized because they need to go through infertility treatments. It's just another diagnostic treatment. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's another quote unquote surgery. Like, would you deny a woman to have her appendix out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Because another woman, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's ludicrousy. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's ludicrous. That's not a word, ludicrousy. It's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. What, um, 
what's covered and what's not covered. I mean, don't even get me started on my soapbox, but there's just a lot that's wrong with um, fertility treatments from the way that doctors treat um, their patients to um, the lack of mental, um, you know, um, help and, and um, through the journey, like, you know, um, it, there's a lot wrong with it. Uh, emotional help, I believe, you, you, and coaching and, and just being there supporting mm -hmm. these women. Yeah, because you come in, you do this, this is the day 14, this is what we do, this is the, this and that, and then they, they send you packing home. Right. Um, yeah, and I mean, yeah, their, their job is done. They got their <laughs> money. Well, and... they put you in a box. It's kind of like a production line. They put mm -hmm. you in a box. They kind of do the same thing for everybody, although mm -hmm. they don't let you in on that. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of, you know help for a woman who has gone through three cycles and it hasn't worked mm -hmm. like, okay, what can you do for me now? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's, they're not open. They're not out of the box thinkers. I had an immune condition that was affecting, you know, mm -hmm. my implantation the second time. Mm -hmm. around. And it wasn't until I did my own research and kept pushing the envelope that I found this, you know, I went to the same doctor Celine Dion went, went to, okay? And she got pregnant with triplets and I had a miscarriage and never heard from the doctor for weeks, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not the quality of the doctor. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the out-of-box thinking that doctors need to have. Um, you know, a high stim cycle is not for everybody, yet that is, you know, what they charge you for. I mean, these are all the things that I work through with patients because they don't know. Mm -hmm. Doctors aren't taking the time to sit and explain to them why you should have genetic testing versus why you shouldn't have genetic testing. And one of the things that makes me so angry these days is that doctors are pushing all these women to do a frozen cycle to genetically test their embryos. But they're, they're giving them these false sense of hope that, that A, the genetic testing is complete because it's not. And there's nothing to say that that genetically incomplete um, embryo that you're throwing away wouldn't turn into a normal baby, yes. um, you know, because it's not a full testing. Plus, they're also hearing, these patients are hearing, if I do this genetic testing, I have better chances of getting pregnant. No, you don't. You just have a better chance of not having a miscarriage. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's all these things that are just um, the doctors, you know, and, and I don't want to put all the onus on the doctors. You know, there are X amount of doctors and there are X amount of patients. And, you know, for um, the sake of their practices, they need to be a certain way. But, you know, they need somebody like me to be ha handling the emotional end of it, even if it's just, you know, where do you get your drugs from? Because mm -hmm. sometimes they'll just give them a list of drugs and they're so expensive. They need to know an alternate place where they can go for drugs. Like, it's as simple as that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I see. I see. Yeah. You're holding their hands and you're walking the journey with them. Yes. It's so overwhelming. Uh, in a sense, I mean, it's, it's, it's like having cancer, breast cancer. You don't even know where to turn. You don't know what, what's up and what's down. And why not have someone there by your side? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Karen, this was amazing. Amazing. I learned so much. Uh, and you packed up so much information in, in a few, in just maybe 30 minutes we've been talking uh, this was great i thank you so much for taking your time and i do want to continue uh in touch with you and and yes. and learning more from you yes and thank you so much for having um for having me and thank you for addressing a subject that i really feel is so important mm -hmm. um you know it really pains me when i hear a woman say i'm due for my mammogram and i'm afraid to go or um i don't want to go for my first my doctor like there's no excuse for that. Like, you know, I really, from the bottom of my heart, believe that early detection is so important mm. and there's no excuse for any woman to die from breast cancer in this day Anymore. and age. They're yeah. just, it, it just, it, it, it's not, we have the technology there. And, you know, I um, also say, you know, to those women out there whose doctors are telling them, oh, well, you know, the um, recommendation is you don't need a mammogram till you're 50. Screw that. Mm -hmm. advocate for yourself and push back. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of, again, smart women don't feel that they can push back on their doctors. Um, you know, for instance, I moved from one state to another right after I had my treatment and they were telling me that, you know, guidelines say to have a mammogram once a year. And I was like, oh no, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I go twice a year for five years. Like my doctor told yeah. me to. 
Um, but you know, somebody who wasn't used to advocating for themselves would go, okay. Mm -hmm. And what if God forbid? And I had a scare, you know, um, you know, so, you know, just listen to your gut ladies and push back and, you know, and, and who cares if your boobs get squished for a second? Mm -hmm. Like it's fine. We've all, we all do it. It, the, 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 the risk (laughs) outweighs the, um, you know, the benefit Mm -hmm. every single time here. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Karen, so much. (laughs) Thank you for having me. And thank you for for this very important um, subject matter that you um, broach in such a lovely way. Thanks.